So, um, as usual, it's going to be state versus action because that's what basically I always talk about, right? But uh, I want to I want to explain why I always talk about state versus action and how important it is really. Like, I'm because it can be we can look at it as just a like an intellectual conversation where actually I think there's a humongous physiological. Uh, misunderstanding right there right um, if you look so I'm going to use nutrition I, I, again nutrition is not my thing uh, I love food too much honestly to go into some of the diet so I've never played with a diet out there really because I like food too much let's be honest I like Nutella I like to have crepes on a while so I, I eat actually very clean mostly stay away from uh, meat and chicken depending on which country I'm in because it seems like I don't digest uh, red meat that well. So if it's not a high quality meat, it wrecks me. My daughter is a bit like that. So again, I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian, basically. But uh, I want to explain about the importance physiologically and neurologically of the state versus action idea, right? And so if you look, for example, at uh, physics, they had um, the, one of the biggest changes changes in the world uh, in the world fine in the history of the world is uh, Sir Isaac Newton don't get me wrong there were many many changes amongst amongst uh, you know the centuries but I think Isaac Newton is with Albert Einstein I would say are the one that created the biggest change in the way we look at the universe and then quantum mechanics right but if you look like whenever you want to study a system you have to study a system at the edges if you try to study it in the center it's too complex right you you'll the, the differences are start to be minute to a point that you'll have a very hard time drawing a pattern. So the only way you'll see that there's a problem is at the edges. This is where you study a system always. Um, Jordan Peterson, the psychologist, basically was talking about that with a great example before you all get excited. Uh, Jordan Peterson says a lot of really, really cool stuff. Some of the stuff you might disagree, but he's basically always talking at the clinical psychologist and that's the Lots of very, very good examples based on that, right? And he was talking about, for example, aggression. Who's more aggressive, men or women? If, from what he was saying, it's about 60, 40 toward men at the center. So you go like, yeah, all right. So it's not that big of a difference. Some women will be more aggressive. Some men will be more aggressive, whatever, right? But if you look at the edges, what does that mean? Let's take the top 1,000 most aggressive people in the world, and you'll find basically men. So that tells you that naturally, men are more aggressive than women. It's not to say some women won't be more aggressive than men, but at the edges, you'll see that aggression is mostly a male uh, dominant thing, right? So it's a little bit the same thing that we saw in physics. For example, uh, you come up with the Newton laws, right? That are very deterministic. A goes B to go C, and then you can go backwards. It goes back to B, goes back to A. And so, and that works just fine. At the center, like you can explain most of the universe using the Newton laws. And, you know, the laws of thermodynamics work and then we made basically, you know, all the, uh, we made so many technical improvements in our, in our lives because of Newton laws. The problem is if you go at the edges, you realize there's an issue with Newton laws, right? For example, there is, it's not time dependent, right? And um, so we know where the Earth is going to be six months from now, where it was six months ago. But yet, you cannot uncook an egg. Time changes things. Right? Like, um, you know that the past is different from the future. I know it sounds simplistic when I say it like this, but that was the problem with Newton's laws. They are not based on time. So we know right away we had an issue. It's, then Einstein comes about and comes with a theory, a theory of relativity and then changes the way we look at the universe again. Right? And now he introduces time and all that stuff. And the fourth dimension, right? And, but again, so you can stay with the relativity and it makes most things work just fine. And then you look at the edges and at the edges for the very, very small relativity doesn't work anymore because of gravity. So here comes quantum mechanics, 1910, 1920. And that changed the world completely because then they got rid of determinism, right? That basically uh, by introducing the, the laws of probability within science, it's a bit more complex, but you get the idea, right? And then that changed everything. Problem with quantum mechanics is at the edges, at the very, very big, it doesn't work anymore. So then from there, they knew that relativity and quantum mechanics are both true because they both work in their area. They, we, we can basically um, make predictions that come true based on those two principles. That's how we know they're true. And that's the difference between science and religion is the ability to make predictions. So we know they're both, but at the edges, there's a problem with both. That told us there's a principle behind that. 
And it seems geometry through the amplitude hedron is a way to exp it's going to be the way forward, it's going to be geometry. So we're getting into very complex stuff. But if you want to look at the amplitude hedron and a guy named Nima, uh, Google it and then you'll see what I'm talking about. It's a fascinating world where we're going forward, basically. So that's the importance of state versus action is anytime you have a system, you need to study the edges to see where this is going. So let's look at the um, nutrition, right? So if we look at uh, nutrition in the center, you get like, you know, you get the normal, basically, chemistry-based um, based things, like how when you break down fat, when you break down uh, carbohydrate, what happens to the body, insulin, and all that stuff. And it's, um, it's true to the degree. You want me to move, Matthaus, no, this way? No, no. Can I move a little bit? Okay, Because yeah, I'm in the, in the center. There, thank you. So, um, everything is chemistry-based, right? It's chemistry is a lot like is determinism, right? It's a lot like Newton laws for physics, right? Um, do they work in the center? Definitely. When you break down carbs, this happens. When you break down, yeah. In the center, yeah, with the minutia, it's true. But it's, ex it's exactly the determinism of Newton laws. You can go forward, you can go backwards and everything. It's not that simple because we forget the arrow of time. So the arrow of time for uh, human biology would be the nervous system. Why? Because the nervous system has evolved throughout evolution. And we need to understand that arrow of time to be basically be able to understand the system at the edges better, to study the system better, right? So I'm going to use nutrition as an example. Uh, this is, we've done a, a longer video with Casper that I will post about the, for example, the chemistry uh, in nutrition, but based on the state of the nervous system. So the nervous system is either in parasympathetic or in sympathetic. Everything is an arch, so you're going to have a combination of both, right? But you're going to be more toward one or more toward the other. Both are present at the same time, both at, the, at a certain intensity. It's like it's an arch, but the arch leans one way or the other, right? So we have um, parasympathetic versus sympathetic. There's actually four states of the nervous system, which is what we call flow, fight, fight, and freeze dividing in one side the parasympathetic, the other sympathetic. That's another video. I talk about this in other stuff. And if you need me to make a video precisely on the four states, I will as well. But in this particular case, I'm, we're going to split into the arch into parasympathetic and sympathetic to simplify a little bit the conversation. So when we talk about uh, nutrition, we usually do not integrate which state you're in. And that to me is a tremendous uh, mistake because there's a vastly different chemical physiological reaction, depending if you're in parasympathetic and sympathetic. That we know for sure because we measured it, don't worry guys out there, there's plenty of studies on this. When you're in a sympathetic state, which is a state you're in when you go into a fight or when you're stressed out or things like this, your digestion goes down. It makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, right? It's because uh, whenever the bear is chasing you or you're chasing the bear, you want all your energy to be directed toward that. So um, digestion will mostly occur in a parasympathetic state. There can be intensity there as well, right? But the digestion will happen on that state because that's where naturally you would go more toward the social um, environment where basically you're not in physical danger of the bear eating you. Or in the case of a hunt, when you need to direct all your energy toward that, right? So, uh, and a hunt, I don't mean the act of hunting because that can be in parasympathetic as well. I mean the act of actually fighting the while, while you're killing the boar or the antelope or stuff like that right so in sympathetic you cannot digest well right we know that for sure that means you're not you're not breaking down the food you're not getting the nutrients out of it so to me it sounds obvious to say that you do not want to eat in a sympathetic state right so that's where you hear dietitians giving you eating advice right eating habits that are better for you but it goes past that. It's not just a habit that will allow you to digest more or less. Those habits will decide if you're digesting really badly or in a good way. So there'll be a much bigger difference between the two that people understand. If you're in a sympathetic state, you cannot digest well. It's not like you can, di you can digest actually very little. So it will create a number of reactions in you, like holding water. You know, like when you have pain right here because you feel like you're not digesting well, it's not necessarily the food itself. It's the state you were in when you ate the food. So there's a certain food, basically, is not necessarily good or bad for you. It's good and bad or bad for you, depending on which state you're in. And that's where I think the conversation needs to start and why it's so important. Let's say you're, you're on a bicycle for eight hours, right? You're tired, 
but you have to keep on going no matter what. That's the equivalent of a bear chasing you. You are in a sympathetic state. You're in pain, but you're still pushing and everything. At that particular moment, your body is not capable of digesting food correctly. So if you take a food uh, that is hard to break down, that is hard to digest, let's say broccoli or something like that, it will actually stress the fuck out of your system. It will stress you out to a point when you will get more, um, more stress out of that food. So it will put your system in a worse state and even more sympathetic will you digest even less. So a food that normally would be healthy in a sympathetic state, let's say like broccoli, would be actually bad for you to eat while you're on the bicycle with two hours to go after six hours already riding. You're in the middle of the Tour de France. I can tell you that eating broccoli would be actually detrimental to your action at that moment, to that state. So I'm not saying that broccoli is bad for you. I'm saying that broccoli will not be good for you. It will be bad for you at that particular moment because you're in a state where you cannot digest it, right? So if you're in that state, you're in the middle of the Tour de France and you don't have a choice because you cannot change your state, right? You can only basically move forward because you need to win the race. Then in that particular case, that, that sugar gel is actually better for you. As weird as it sounds, is it good for your health? At that particular second, that's your best option. That doesn't mean that if you eat that shit on the outside and everything, it won't do a lot of bad. It's just at that particular moment, it will be better for you to have that gel, which is so highly glycemic, than it would be to have the broccoli. So now, can you do better than the gel? Probably, I'm sure we can go to, uh, there's an argument there. But again, the argument you're gonna have is toward the center. I'm talking about at the edges, because that's where you can work on the system better. In an extremely stressed out state, right? Like you're in the middle of the Tour de France and everything, that high glycemic uh, gel is better for you than broccoli, right? Because you cannot change the state at that moment. So that, for example, when are you in a sympathetic state as well? When you're extremely anxious, right? When you're in a very, very anxious state, you notice you crave highly glycemic food, like highly sugar and everything. That means that in that state, basically trying to have a, you, you've been there where you're anxious, um, for whatever reason, you had to fight with a spouse or whatever, and you try to eat, and then it hurts right here, and you feel, oh my God, I can't digest, and you're gonna hold water, you're gonna feel like shit. That healthy food at that moment was not good. When you're that anxious, when you're sympathetic, set, again, highly glycemic food will be more easily digested, so in that case, better for you. Does that mean I want you to eat highly glycemic food all the time? No, what I want you is I want you to change the state so that you can eat healthy. But you have to understand that you cannot hit healthy without changing your state first. Because if you're in an extremely anxious state, you are better served eating chocolate than broccoli. You should always eat chocolate or broccoli, but that's another problem. Um, in, again, in a sympathetic state, you are better with glycemic food than food that are hard to digest. That's just a physiological fact. So again, I'm not saying you should have highly glycemic food. I'm saying that you need to change your state in order to uh, to, to be in a proper physiological mood in order to digest that healthy food. And that's what the difference is. And so now that's where evolutionary biology can help us because it's telling us how the nervous system has evolved. The nervous system has evolved from like, you know, the invertebrates to the reptilian and everything. But um, there's a part that was done basically as, in, as an individual. And then when we turned mammals about, a, I think it was a million years ago, we started to go toward developing the parasympathetic state toward the sorry, parasympathetic nervous system toward the ventral vagus nerve, right? Um, that was done to live in society, to live in a group. So that tells us that evolution has made up as group animal, so social animal, right? So we know this. But that also means that whether you in an individual state isolated versus within a group of your choosing a tribe, I'm talking about a mass of people that you feel you don't belong with, because that in itself is an isolation thing. So I'm talking about within, within your own tribe, within a, a group of people you appreciate, that will trigger the parasympathetic state. So that means there's an entire thing about, for example, we know that for food, that's why I use nutrition. It's like if you cook, remember like what is the best, the most important room in the house in many cultures is the kitchen, right? Because it takes two hours to make the meal. Everybody's in the kitchen talking, getting into, you know, you're with your tribe, right? And you get all the thing going, everybody's in good mood and talking, you're socializing. You're going toward that parasympathetic state. And then you smell the food, and then you basically, all that hour before while the food is cooking is where you, you're gonna be in your base state to eat the food. And then you're there and you're at the table and you're chewing slowly because you're talking, because you're sharing, right? You are socializing, you are in a parasympathetic state. And after that, you keep on talking, and then, and then you can go home or go to bed. But basically, you have created a perfect 
parasympathetic environment that we, we had through evolution to create a parasympathetic state to be able to digest the food the best way. So then, it, then at that moment, you can eat foods that are harder to digest. The healthy food, basically the broccoli, the all the stuff that needs that is harder to break down, you need to eat that in a better parasympathetic state, right? I'm being visited by a goose. So, and so this has the, the key of all this is that means that in order to, I, if that thing attacks me, you're gonna see me kill a goose on film. So, the idea, I'm not feeling you, dude. Um, the idea is like in order to eat healthy, you first gonna have to be on the parasympathetic side of the nervous system. You're gonna have to be in a social group environment where you belong. So that means that eating habits, good habits, right, will define whether you can eat healthy or not. Because remember, healthy food in the wrong state will end up with you not digesting it properly. Therefore, you don't get the, the, the good stuff out of it. So that means that the group environment will can help you digest can help you being healthier without that eating while checking your phone will stress you out while checking social media all that stuff which can put you into a sympathetic state will have his own uh his own basically bad influence on you regardless of the food you're eating so even in that case if you're on the phone all the time on social media you are more better served uh, eating chocolate than basically healthy food so that's the thing, change your state first in order to be healthy and to eat healthy and to be healthy. Because the other way, to eat healthy and be healthy, you're going to have to change your state first. I mean, having the proper habits. That is why it's so important to have the proper rituals, because they will literally de decide if you can be healthy or not. And then you will see actually that be another video that we can, will establish a sensing to, toward exercise, right? Exercising within your tribe with a correct group will actually put you toward the parasympathetic state same thing as for nutrition and then that alone will be uh, able to decide whether you're in a more anabolic state versus catabolic state you will uh, decide if you're more toward internal torque versus external torque and which which one we can use to have the best results that we need that means in a group setting you have uh, therefore you go toward parasympathetic toward internal torque you uh, it will be better um, probably toward coordination. That's another video that I'll make. But the state you're in, right, will also change the way you train. So the habits you're gonna form around training will direct if you're gonna build muscle or not, if you're gonna build toward skill or not. So the, the entire base to our training as well that will depend on the habits you create there. So the habits are, are more important than just for your mental state where people have a tendency to divide from the physical state, right? It, there's actually on a neurological level, therefore on a physiological level, there are changes that happen based on your habits because that's what evolutionary biology tells us is that if we follow the correct habit, we follow evolution correctly, your body will respond correctly to the stress. If you do it incorrectly, then you will actually change your state, will change the, basically the chemistry of the body. Right? So it's not enough to talk about anabolic window and stuff like that. First, we have to talk about the state. And after that, we can talk about the chemistry of the human body. Cool. Thanks, guys.